United States Steel, USS, presents the Theater Guild on the Air. Tonight's play, Call It a Day. Tonight's stars, Lynn Fontan and Alfred Lump. United States Steel Corporation, the world's greatest maker of steel, identified by the familiar USS trademark, invites you to listen to the Theater Guild on the Air production of Call It a Day by Dodie Smith, starring Lynn Fontan and Alfred Lump as Dorothy and Roger Hilton. And now here is Lawrence Langner, co-director with Teresa Halburn of the Theatre Guild, one of America's foremost theatrical producers, to introduce the play. Mr. Langner. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. With tonight's play, Call It A Day, the Theatre Guild on the air calls it a season for the summer months. Later on in the evening, we'll tell you about the United States Steel Summer Program, The Hour of Mystery, and its first broadcast which will star the outstanding actor Laurence Olivier. I want to take this opportunity on behalf of the Theatre Guild to thank the United States Steel Corporation for the opportunity they've given us to bring some of the finest plays and actors of the theatre into millions of homes throughout the country. Also to thank you, our listening audience, for your splendid support. And to further express our appreciation for the awards and commendations which the program received in its first season on the air, from Motion Picture Daily, Radio Daily, Billboard, This Month Magazine, Radio Life Magazine, the uh, Women's National Radio Committee, and the Institute for Education by Radio. Our play tonight, Call It a Day, was one of the most successful comedies ever produced by the Theatre Guild. Our stars, Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontan, are famous as the most brilliant acting team in the English-speaking theatre. They are currently appearing in the successful Theatre Guild John C. Wilson production of Oh, Mistress Mine at the Empire Theatre in New York. And now the 500,000 stockholders and employees of United States Steel invite you to listen to the Theatre Guild on the air production of Dodie Smith's gay and witty comedy, Call It a Day, starring Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine. spring, 8 a.m., and in the town of Scarsdale, 30 minutes from New York, a shaft of blazing sunlight pierces the bedroom curtains of Mr. and Mrs. Roger Hilton and lights upon the master. The shaft of sunlight moves on to the pillow beside him, the lady, and then the day begins. Come in. Your coffee, ma'am. Oh, good morning, Ellie. Just put it right there on the table beside me. Did I... it do it right? Strong's poison. No cream, no sugar. Yes, that's right. It's just something to jab me in the ribs and wake me up. Well, that'll do it. Your blood pressure can stand it. Wouldn't touch it myself. No, I need it somehow. Now, my husband's different. Ellie, he needs shaking. Mm -hmm. You'd better attend to that now. How's that? Shake him. Someone always has to, and I hate getting out of bed for it. Susan, our last maid, was a great shaker. <coughs> what happened? Don't be afraid of him. Go to it, Ellie. Dig in. Well, they've asked me to do some strange things, but this shake. Don't get used to our ways. Just brace yourself and go to it. Well, if you say so. Oh. Mm. Sir. Sir. Here. 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 There. 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 Now. <laughs> No, no, stop. No, what, what is it? <laughs> Bravo, Ellie, you've done it. Mm. He's awake. My dear, she's better than Susan. 
What's going on? Who are you? I'm new. Did I shake you too hard? This is Ellie, dear. She started yesterday. Well, you have a different technique from Susan. Short and sharp instead of slow and steady. You want me to be steadier tomorrow? Yes, please. You did very well for the first day, Ellie, and this coffee is delicious. Dot, you know I object to all this. I must say, I think you ought to shake me yourself. No, no, certainly not. It gives me a headache. You always let Susan shake. Well, that was different. Susan's been with us for ages. Um, well, um, Dot, I do feel this isn't the sort of work you should delegate to others at such an unimportant hour. It makes me feel like an old fixture. What shall I do this morning, madam? Oh, just <laughs> shake my husband and run the vacuum cleaner around. <laughs> We have done this when we were first married. Don't mind him, Ellie. He's really impossible till he's had his shower and his breakfast. Open the curtains and let some sunlight in, will Just you? Just as you wish. Oh, oh, what a day. Look, it's dazzling. Treacherous, I call it. <laughs> it really does something to you, doesn't it? The first yes. real spring day we had. Wonderful. Dangerous, I say. Dangerous? What are you talking about? It looks all right to me. Mm, that's the trouble with it. It tempts people. There'll be a lot of pneumonia cases tomorrow. Oh, nonsense, Ellie. It's a lovely morning. That's just it. On a day like this, people start leaving things off, and then there's no knowing what'll happen. You mark my words. A day like this brings trouble. Anything else you need, ma'am? No, thank you, Well, Ellie. then I'll be going. All right. So, we have a Cassandra in our midst, a prophetess of doom. She doesn't trust spring. I wonder if she's right. Certainly makes me feel fine. Morning for a good, stiff, cold shower. And that's oh, what I'm going to do right oh, now. Oh, 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 this you is know, a great man. You should have waked me up an hour <laughs> earlier this morning. I've taken a five-mile oh, sprint before oh, breakfast. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, oh yes, I would have. Might have been a good idea. Take that tummy down a bit. Why do you see a tummy? I have no tummy. Uh, how inconvenient. Besides, you women with this skinny complex are laying up a wretched old age for yourselves. Stringy, that's what you'll be. Uh, thank you, old seven chins to ball pate. I consider myself <laughs> modern and streamlined. <laughs> streamline, streamline women with wind resistance and a peel of a toothpick. <laughs> I tell you, this streamlining is the abomination of our time. Streamlined bathrooms, streamlined soap, streamlined doorknobs, <laughs> streamlined shower. No wonder modern man is secured. Not a darn thing he can lay his hand on. Roger, don't be vulgar, please. Get on with your shower. Well, what do you think I'm going to do? No, Yes? Oh, Mom. Oh, hello, Ann, darling. Catherine's got the bathroom first again. She'll be in there forever, and I'll be late for school. I've got an algebra exam that's positively gruesome. Mom, can you think of any possible use for algebra in my afterlife? Afterlife? I mean, after school life. Especially since I'm going to be a poet. Oh, since when? Since I've been reading Edna St. Vincent Millay. Oh, Mom, she's the loveliest poet. I've been reading aloud since six this morning. Oh, darling, doesn't Kath object? Oh, she went out for a walk this morning about six. And then she came back and grabbed the bathroom first. Kath went for a walk at six. Is she all right? Oh, I guess so. Spring has broken out. <laughs> Listen to Bob. Yes, he seems to have broken out too, doesn't he? Daddy, <laughs> would you like to hurry up and lend me your bathroom? No, Ed. Would you? Would you? No. Oh, don't be a drip, Daddy. Cat's morning around with a new hairdo in our bathroom, and I'm going to be years late for school. All right, well, wait till I get dry and get something on. You're a darling. Mommy, you don't mind if I'm first, do you? No, no, dear. Mommy. Do you think I'm psychic? Psychic? Why? Well, I feel as if I can see things. <laughs> I expect it's because I'm sensitive. I've got a sensitive mouth, haven't I, Mommy? I expect it's sensitive about that tooth inside, and you've got to see Dr. J. Mother, and? just when I'm talking about important things, you shrivel me up. Oh, darling, I didn't mean to shrivel you up. But there really are times when I'm afraid you're getting morbid. Lots of great people have been morbid. <laughs> Mommy... If I die, I'd rather you didn't cremate me. Oh, Anne, you're not to talk like that. It's not a bit funny to be morbid. You're not feeling ill, are you, darling? No, Mommy. Just kind of strange sometimes. I guess I've outgrown my strength. Silly baby. Here you are, Nelson. Thank you, Roger. You're not you call your father super. Roger. It's fashionable for children to treat their parents as if they were human. Now get along with you. Thanks. Roger, do you think that child's all right? Healthy as a horse. She's getting the most extraordinary ideas about death and poets. Oh, just a phase. You had it when we were engaged. I'm worried about Kath, too. Oh, woman, you are a worrier. Ever since she started posing for her portrait with Paul, she's behaving very strangely. Getting up at six in the morning and spending forever in the bathroom. Roger, are you 
you sure Paul Francis is all right? You know what his reputation is. Grossly exaggerated. You met his wife. You don't imagine that he'd... But if you were making love to her... My dear woman, you're crazy. And even if he is a bit of a wolf, why, she'd be as safe with him as a maiden aunt. I've known him for 30 years. I was at school with him. Ah, but you weren't an attractive young girl at school. Oh, well, it's neither here than... uh... (laughs) Just worrying. There's nothing wrong with the girl but temperament. Maybe a touch of the season. Oh, you mean spring is here, so is I hope so. Say, where's that striped shirt? Striped shirt? Well, maybe Ellie was right. Cat up at six and talking about death. You bursting into song. I'll take it, dear. Another shirt gone to pieces. Hello? Dot? Yes? Look at that collar. Don't Listen, think. dear, for our trip to town this afternoon, I want you to look absolutely ratish. Good heavens, Muriel, what for? Looks like shredded wheat. Roger, I'll Roger. I'll explain it all to you on the way in. That brother of mine, he really is a problem. You've got to help me with it. Yeah. Now, we're meeting with the plaza for cocktails. But I thought the... we were going to a matinee. Torn cuffs and they've sharpened the collar. Shut up, shut up. Oh, shut darling, up. one for luck with Beatrice Gwynn. I've got the ticket. But I thought we'd make a whirl and do both. Oh, you've really got to help me with Frank. How, how? I'll what do you mean? explain it all later. Now, I'll see you on the train, darling, and look to buy. I'll do my best. I know. Muriel Weston and I are spending the day together. Well, I'm glad it's you, not me. Lord, how that woman talks. After the matinee, we're going to cocktails with her brother, Frank. Is that that uh, tennis-playing glamour boy uh-huh. who's been planting rubber in Brazil? Muriel says he's very conservative and shy. Really. And her brother, that I will have to see. From his picture, he's tall and distinguished and very thin. Well, if he's fresh from the wilds of Brazil, he's probably looking for something a little more skittish than you two conservative females. Oh, Roger, really? What's the matinee? It's a new hit, one for luck, with Beatrice Gwynn. Gwynn? What? Well, that reminds me. She's supposed to see me about her income tax sometime today. You know, she got herself into a jam over a picture earnings, and her Hollywood agent asked me to straighten her out. Oh, you're pretty offhand about the glamorous Beatrice Gwynn. Oh, just another one of those streamlined young women, as far oh. as I'm concerned. She either won't show up or she'll cancel her appointment uh, at the last minute. Uh, Roger, here, come here. Let me have a good look at you. Are you wearing your handsomest striped shirt? Oh, uh, better wear something. And your most distinguished cufflink? Oh, Do I see a glint in your eye of interest in Miss Gwynn? Do I spy a greenish cast in your eye? Uh, yeah. uh, Nothing of the sort. If she does keep her appointment, don't forget to pull it in your stomach and hold up all those chins. She'll be less interested in my waistline than in her deductions. Roger. Roger. Yes. Uh, tell me something. What? Well, what's all this deep thinking about? When you woke up this morning, you said something about feeling like a household fix. Sure I did. I suppose everyone feels that way once in a while. I wonder if perhaps I feel that way, too. For example, Roger, what am I wearing? Uh, wh- Why? Well, it's something very becoming. No, I happen to be wearing the Valentina negligee you gave me for Christmas. Well, it's very becoming and very, very expensive, as uh-huh. I recall. <laughs> you happen not to have kissed me this morning. Oh? Well, may I make a small correction? No, I don't think so. Well, oh, um, oh, come on, perhaps no, I, I think it... Oh, well, mm. well Roger. <laughs> really, I... <laughs> very nice. Oh, very oh, nice. Roger. You're a household fixture feeling all good, huh? Well, done, I well we better make sure. Yes. No, no, all right. Yes. Uh, Roger, darling, uh, we aren't beginning to take each other for granted, are we? Well, I hope not. All right, put your beautiful necktie on. All right. <laughs> Wonderful, peaceful moment of lingering over breakfast. Dan, get off school on time? I think so. Cass, are you sitting for your portrait today? Yes, all afternoon. Enjoying the sittings? Oh, I suppose so. Great fellow, Paul Francis. Fine artist, too. Will you excuse me? Cass, where are you going? Now you come back and finish your eggs. I've had all I want. You haven't eaten a thing. Dot, make her eat some breakfast. Uh, Cass, come and sit down, dear. Besides, I want to talk to you about something. Oh, mother. Now sit down, sit down. Will somebody please pass me the marmalade? Yeah, dear, Cass. You really will have to be a little more considerate. Mother, you know, please. you took Anne's turn in the bathroom. Oh, this heaven, morning. just because I spend a few extra minutes, anyone would think we were at boarding well, school. Mother, Dad, will you let me have the spare room, please? Now, Kath, we've gone into that before. I tell you, I'll move out when we have guests. No, no, you'll always make a grievance of it and leave things behind. Guests hate finding grubby bits of powder puss in the drawers. Now, I simply must keep the pa- spare bedroom. Well, what's the matter with your room? Oh, Dad, after all, when you get to be 17 years old, it's time that you had some privacy. Is, is it Anne's early morning reading that upset you? That and her early evening prayers. She now says her prayers under a picture of Shelley. Say, uh... Is this, is this all the sugar we have? It isn't only Anne. It's, 
It's just that I want to be alone. But why, darling? Why? I could understand if you were working or studying or something. Well, maybe I will take up something. If you'll give me the spare bedroom. No, no, Kath. I'm sorry, dear. Oh, you're not a bit sorry. You're the most ununderstanding mother I've ever met. Oh, sure, How can anyone be so beastly on a lovely day when everything... everything... Yes, Kath, what's the matter with you? You know, she didn't put much butter on oh, this nothing. toast. <laughs> Look here, Kath. I suppose Mr. Francis... Isn't... Uh, there's nothing... Hey, what's, what's the matter with this Cass. new maid, anyway? Cass, did you hear what I said? No sugar, no cream. Cass. Stingy with the butter. Cass, is something wrong? What do you mean? Well, sometimes married men... Mother, how can uh, you? I think you've got a thoroughly nasty mind. Oh, darling, why, I'm sorry. Oh, you're but... horrid, and I hate this whole rotten house Cass. and everyone in it. I hate it, I hate it, I hate Cass. it. Cass, Oh, leave her alone. Let her be. Eat your breakfast, darling. Really, there must be something wrong with her. Just a phase. Did you call, ma'am? No, no, we're through, Ellie. Well, shall I clear off now? Yes, you may. I'm afraid Miss Catherine didn't eat much. Spring is here, all right, yes, ma'am. Yes, it certainly is. Say, look at that tree over there. It's nearly out. Apple, isn't it? Yes, it is. They always come out first. More fool of them. Oh, now, come on, Ellie. A day like this does everyone good. Makes you feel young. Makes you feel you can do anything in the That's world. That's just it. Puts ideas into people's heads. Have you never heard the saying? What saying? The first spring day is in the devil's pay. The first spring day is... In the devil's pay. I'll answer. Hello? This is Elsie, Mr. Hilton. Yes, Elsie. I thought I'd better let you know that Miss Gwynn called. Oh? To confirm her appointment for today. She'll be in right after her matinee. Right after the matinee. Oh, very good. I'll be the office as soon as I get through at court, Elsie. All right, Mr. Hilton. Ah, uh, goodbye. The first spring day is in the devil's pay. Hmm. In a moment, we will continue with the second act of Call It a Day, produced by the Theatre Guild on the air and sponsored by the United States Steel Corporation. And here, speaking for United States Steel, is George Hicks. Good evening. We've all been reading and hearing about the exciting celebration that's going on in Detroit, Michigan. It's the golden jubilee of the automobile industry and marks its 50th great year of progress. Among the parades and other uh, big events in the Jubilee, one of the outstanding features is an antique automobile exposition in which the newest 1946 cars are on display against a background of early model horseless carriages. The dramatic contrasts in these displays of new against old are the most eloquent tribute to the forward strides of the great American automobile industry, to its pioneers of yesterday and its workers and management of today. Perhaps most of all, it's a tribute to the men who design America's cars. Year after year, these designers, stimulated by the American system of free enterprise and free competition, have demanded better and more versatile materials in order to try to make their particular cars safer, more comfortable, and more beautiful. And I hardly need to tell you that the one material of which they have demanded and received ever greater results is steel. Yes, from the early days of the automobile... The designers have worked hand-in-hand hand with the men of the steel industry in the development of new and better steels. And today, for example, the United States Steel Corporation alone makes more than 100 different kinds of steel for automobiles. It took millions of dollars and countless hours in painstaking research to discover and develop these new steels. But looking at today's cars, I'm sure you'll agree it was worth it. For it was with these steels that the automotive engineers have transformed those horseless carriages into today's sleek beauties with their tremendous strength and extraordinary protection. So I hope all of you will join with me and the United States Steel Corporation as we send our congratulations to America's automobile industry and its golden jubilee celebration in Detroit. We pause now for station identification. Your station is KECA Los Angeles. You are listening to the Theater Guild on the Air, sponsored by the industrial family that serves the nation, United States Steel. Tonight's play, Dodie Smith's gay comedy of family life, Call It a Day, stars Lynn Fontan and Alfred Lunt as Dorothy and Roger Hilton. 
Now the curtain rises on the second act. In further explanation of which point, I refer you to my letter of March 18th on the corporation report. Sincerely yours, and so forth. That's the last of the letters, Elsie. Yes, Mr. Hilton. Now, let's see. When can we be expecting this, Miss Gwynn? About 5.30, she said. Yeah, she'll probably be in quite a fix. Won't know a thing about her tax deductions. These theater people never do. Oh, I know. Such a knockabout sort of life for a woman. Glad my girls haven't an artistic bone in their bodies. They take after their mother. Oh, your daughters are such lovely girls. Mrs. Hilton's a lucky woman. Yes, yeah. Well, we both are. We? Oh, yeah. yes. Both girls, nice, sensible girls, you know. Oh, I'm sure of it. Mrs. Hilton worries about them, but I say they never had a thought that they didn't tell her. Oh, I'm sure you're right, Mr. Hilton. Uh, by the way, Elsie, I think I'll take an hour off this afternoon, get a little exercise over at the club. I've been feeling a little stuffy around the middle lately. Uh... Yes, Mr. Hilton, it's this sudden spring weather. Always makes me feel sort of melancholy. So I brought some flowers for your dad. Well. May I put this teeny little rosebud in your lapel? Why, thank you, Elsie. Why, that's very nice. Oh, it's nothing. (laughs) My dear Kath, I want your face in repose when I'm painting. Now, just look serene. Oh, how can I? This horrible shawl smells disgusting. Nonsense. (laughs) Oh, and you stick out your lip that way. You look like that Marchmont girl in Santa Fe. Hmm. I wonder what's happened to Lily. Oh. Probably dead. Lily who? Uh, a model I used to have. Oh, Lord, wasn't she beautiful? Your figure isn't a patch on her. I've got a very nice figure. Hmm. Hey, I've got an idea, Catherine. Put that shawl right over your head. I won't. The shawl's filthy. Oh, now, look here, young woman. I won't woman. do it. You can't order me around that what way. What is this? And what's more, I'll tear up this dirty old shawl. Just go to Santa what? Fe and find your old Lily Marchmont. I'm going home. All right. Oh, Paul. I wish I was dead. Oh, my dear child. Oh, it's been no. so awful. I can't even cry at night because of Anne hearing. Is it that you're tired of me just in a few weeks? Oh, for the Lord's sake, shut up, Catherine. You're talking as if something, as if something had... Well, heavens, I haven't even kissed you. Or have I? No. But you were going to when that wretched old tramp came along. Bless him. Paul, that morning on Orchard Hill when it was all beginning... It isn't going to begin, Kat. But why? Though I hate to stress the fact I really am married. I'm sorry about your wife, but she must be used to it by now. Huh? Oh, I know you make love to dozens of women. It's hateful. But it doesn't seem to make any difference. Mm, I was afraid it mightn't. That day on Orchard Hill. In my whole life, I've only once been on Orchard Hill at seven in the morning, and you had to be there. Don't you think that was fate? I do not. I think it was the after effects of a party. Oh, Paul, Paul, you're just pretending. You couldn't have said those wonderful things if you didn't mean them. You were just trying to discourage me for my own good. Paul, please, kiss me now. <clears throat> Catherine, for heaven's sake, let me go. Thank the Lord, saved by the bell. Oh, wait. Catherine, would you let me go? Paul. <laughs> Come in. Yes? Hello. Uh, Mr. Francis, we only met once for a minute. I don't think you noticed me much. That was certainly an oversight. So you're Catherine's sister. Come in. And what do you want? Well, as a matter of fact, I want some money. It's a pleasure. How much? Oh, no, please. Cat's sure to have it. Oh. You see, coming home, I saw a special edition of Edna St. Vincent Millay in that little bookstore. It's only $3, and the man said it might be gone tomorrow. So I thought as it's nearer to here than to home, and I didn't think Mr. Francis would mind, as it is all Snap it up. It's a bargain. Kath, I'm going to make you run along with your sister. You're too tired to sit anymore. But I'm not tired. No, 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 no. Shop shut for today. This portrait's all wrong, anyhow. Not at all sure I shall go on with it. Oh. Perhaps I shall paint Anne instead. She's got a very interesting mouth. Rather morbid, isn't it? Mmm, wonderfully. Kath, go change your clothes and then go. Oh, very well. (sighs) Oh, what a lot of fascinating things. Hmm. Oh, Oh, this little painting. Hmm? It isn't... Oh, it couldn't be. It's a portrait of Miss Millay. That's right. Did you do it? Oh, yes. It's a sketch I did of her some time ago. Oh. Say, like to have it? Oh, you couldn't... You couldn't possibly mean... Why, yes, I could. Why not? Oh, Mr. Francis. And I'm ready to go. Look what he's done. He's given me a picture of Miss Millay. Oh, I... I think we must get it home carefully. Cass... 
Do you suppose we could take a taxi home on account of the picture, can we? I'll pay you out of my allowance in weekly installments. All right, you go ahead and find a cab. I have to talk to Mr. Francis a moment about my next sitting. All right, I'll go. Mr. Francis, it's a pity I'm too old to hug you. Ah, a thousand pities. Goodbye. Bye. Paul, please. Uh, 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 now go away. Paul, please don't be angry, but would you meet me once more on Orchard Hill? I would not. Oh, tonight, please, please. No, we mustn't. Oh, Paul, you can't back out now. It's too cruel. Nine o'clock, please. Nine o'clock. Lord, I'm a lunatic. No, you're not. Oh, I'm so happy I could die. I'll go now. Goodbye. Goodbye, Paul. Oh, Dorothy, this is a divine martini And these pastries, Muriel mm. How can you eat pastries with a martini? It's indecent I know, but I'm on a marvelous new diet You eat all you want between meals <laughs> And then you never want a really big meal Doesn't it work with you? I get your meaning and I don't like it, thank you Well, after all those chocolates we had at the theater. Come now, we dropped over half of oh, those. Oh, don't mention it. When that box fell down and those chocolates rolled over, I thought I'd go right through the floor Did with Did you see that wind girl? She glared at us. Well, I don't blame her. You know, that girl was interesting. Oh, did I tell you Roger is looking after her income tax? What's that? That bundle of sex appeal? No, Muriel, Roger is a staid married man. Listen, I'm suspicious of any married man who isn't actually in a wheelchair. That's how I feel about them. Oh, you're a bitter girl, aren't you? Now, about my brother Frank. Yes, what is this business about Frank? Well, I'll tell you. Now, oh, I wonder what's keeping him. He should be here. I've got to leave for my train oh, in no. a minute. Oh, no, you don't. Come on now. Tell well, me. Well, Frank is on leave again from his rubber plantation, and this time I'm determined to get him married off if I have to drag him to the altar. But doesn't Frank have the usual tropical reaction? My dear, he thinks women are on a higher plane. Oh, dear. <laughs> Does he know of your plans? Well, I've been paving the way in my letters for weeks. I think I'll pull it off if you'll help. Who's the girl? Dorothy Walton. Oh, you know no, her. no. Well, she's a bit short in the oh, wind oh. and long in the tooth, but she's still got most of her Oh, Muriel, you're revolting. Still, if they both really like each other... Don't be funny. They haven't met as yet. Oh, I see. The point is to get the thing so settled in their minds before they meet that neither of them likes to back out. Not that Dolly will be doing any backing out. She's just had her roots touched up. She's a blonde now, you know. She's going right into battle. I never heard anything so cold-blooded. They're both coming to spend the weekend. I'll bet you I have them engaged in a week. Are you sure Frank wouldn't rather see you alone this afternoon? Mercy, no. I talked to him on the phone, and he's dying for female companionship, and he doesn't mean his sister. And that's where you come in. You ought to help put the skids under him by talking up marriage in a general sort of way. After all, you do approve of marriage as an institution, don't you? Oh, indeed I do. Of course I do. Well, that's all there is to it. You're part of the selling plan. Oh, I wish Frank would hurry. I've simply got to go right now. Now, darling, no, don't go. Not till Frank comes, at least. Oh, there he is. Thank heaven. Frank. Muriel, I'm awfully sorry. You're just in time. I'm just running. Goodbye. I don't have to introduce you to, do I? How do you do? How do you do? Oh, how darling of you, Frank. What beautiful spring flowers you bought. That really was sweet of you. Now, you sit down here and I'll take my packages. Doc's got lots of time. Now, just pile the flowers on top of my parcels, will you? And stick another one of those cakes in my mouth. Yes, there you are. Thank you. The door man will get me a cab. Goodbye. See you on the weekend, Frank. What was that? I think she said she'd see you on the weekend. Oh, yes, of course. I've been looking forward to it. You'll enjoy it. Yes, I'm sure of it. The flowers were really for you. For me? How very nice of you. It's strange. Somehow I feel as if I know you. Yes, I know. Isn't it... Isn't it wonderful? It is rather wonderful. I thought I was going to be awfully self-conscious. Did you? I think I am a bit. I rather like the sensation. Well, just throwing us together like this might have been extremely awkward. It might. Why? Well, we mightn't have liked each other. Well, that wouldn't have been very serious, would it? Besides, we do, don't we? Look here, I I was wondering, are you fond of the theater? Oh, very. Uh, Muriel and I have just been to a matinee, a play called One for Luck. Oh, yes? Was it good? Well, not very convincing. Oh? Two people meeting for the first time and falling violently in love. It never happens, really, does it? Well, I think it might, under certain circumstances. Well, I think they'd have to be very special ones, wouldn't they? I don't suppose suppose you feel like another show, do you? But (laughs) couldn't we have dinner... (laughs) <laughs> I'm making an awful fool of myself. I'm really not always like this. I I think it must be relief. What on earth do you mean? Well, you're the prettiest woman I've ever seen in my life. Oh, dear, dear. Let's shake hands, shall we? We haven't uh, yet. How do you do, Mr. Hayden? <laughs> well, well, please. Frank, then. Am I allowed to call you Dolly? Dolly? 
No one ever calls me Dolly. Well, Muriel does. No, no, Dart or Dorothy. Oh. Well, I shall call you Dolly. Oh. oh what's the matter? You look so strange. Well, look, I shan't try to rush you oh, anymore, but... but... Somehow it seems yes. so hypocritical but after Muriel's letters, please. and I wanted us to be friends as no, soon no, as possible. No, no, Have no. I offended you? No, no, it isn't that. I'm being all kinds of an eager fool. Look, I'll tell you what. Let's... No, no, please stop. I'm Dorothy Hilton, not Dorothy Walton. Oh, my Lord. I... I've got a husband and grown-up children. I kept but... trying to stop you. I'm terribly Look, sorry. Look, I can't even start to apologize. Oh, no, it was my fault. I was so slow. Of no. course, it was a natural mistake. Dot Hilton, Dolly Walton on the telephone. Yes, well, please don't let it worry you. Of it... course, Dolly's a great friend of Muriel's. Naturally, you'd ask I her. know you think it's kinder to pretend I haven't made a fool no, of myself, I... but you see, nothing like this has ever happened to me. I guess I'm in love with you. You know, it's just because you've been planning to fall in love, because you've been lonely. Yes, probably. Are you happily married? Oh, yes. Because if not... I am, I tell you. All right, I'll come and see you. I won't get underfoot. Half a loaf, you know. Well, there isn't even half a loaf. Well, then, crumbs, my dear. I'd be grateful for anything I can get. But this is... When can I come? This is insane. Of course you can't come. You must go out to Muriel's and meet Dolly. Can I come this evening? No, no. And see the grown-up children, the happy husband? Don't you see that I'm not in a normal state of mind? Any man would normally be groveling with embarrassment looking for you to go. But But... I am going. Oh, no, no, no. Please don't. Or let me come and see you. No, no. Let me work this thing out my own way. Where do you live? No, uh, well, uh, here's, here's a pencil. Uh, 46 Beach Tree Road in Scarsdale. You mustn't anyhow, not till you've seen Dolly. Oh, no. Oh, poor Dolly. She's had her roots done. Uh, <laughs> her what? I know, it's awful. I can't help laughing. <laughs> <laughs> what am I laughing at? This is really no laughing matter. It's I must Look, go. I'll, I'll put you on the train. Oh, no, no. And I'm coming this evening no, at 9 o'clock. No. 43 no. Beach Tree. No, no, 46. No, really, we've both oh, got crazy. <laughs> I'll think about it. I'll write 46 you. Beach Tree Road tonight at <laughs> no, 9. No, no. Yes? Miss Gwynne is here to see you, Mr. Hilton. Oh, well, uh, <clears throat> send her in, Elsa. Yes, sir. Miss Gwen, how do you do? Hello. I'm late. I ought to have called you and put it off. Well, I'm glad you didn't. This tax matter is getting urgent. Do you think I'll end in jail? Not if you pay up. Well, I can't, you know. I haven't got it. You spent it? I suppose so. It's gone. You're a very extravagant young person. Look here, do you mind cutting out the coy, fatherly stuff? I'm feeling irritable. Oh, I'm very sorry. I expect you're tired after your matinee. I'm not tired, just bad-tempered. Well, let's get down to it. What do I have to do? Just answer a few questions to start with. What did you actually earn? Nearly $30,000. But that's so long ago, and it's all gone. It's not fair. I know, I know. I'm on your side entirely, but the government's against us. (laughs) Now, let's see. That was in 1943. You've been... Well, they've been pretty patient, you know. Well, um, now, uh, where were you living? What on earth has that got to do with you? You must have had a wretched matinee. Did they throw things at you? No, no. They clapped most politely. You know, there's a superb love scene in this play, a real one. I might just as well have been playing with a lamppost as play with Harold. Oh? Well, as a matter of fact, he he wasn't so bad in the beginning. Oh? No, it was just at the opening of the third act. Uh Uh-huh. Some cow of a woman upset a whole box of candy. They rolled all over the place. Uh After that, Harold went to pieces. Uh Everyone giggled and hushed and turned around. Do you wonder I was wild? No, no. Then Harold just turned to stone. Oh, that must have been terrible for you. You don't know what I have to put up with. I think I'll stay home tonight and make my understudy happy. Uh, Shall we see if we can get something on these deductions, if you feel up to it? You know, I like it here. You're not a bit... My idea of a corporation lawyer is terrific on taxes. Well, what is your idea? Old and... Well, thank you. Uh, Now let's get on to expenses. In uh, Hollywood, I suppose you lived in a hotel. Only for a bit. I had a house most of the time in Palm Springs. What was the rent? I don't know. I didn't pay it. I wanted to share it, but my boyfriend wouldn't let me. Boyfriend? The one who was paying the rent. Uh, Well, I don't think we need to go into that for the tax inspector. Oh, please, don't bother to whitewash for me. Now, my good girl. Don't call me your good girl. Not suitable. Now, look here, Miss... Beatrice Gwynn with the flowers in your hat. The inspector doesn't give two hoots about your boyfriend in Palm Springs, and neither do I, so you can just stop trying to shock me. 
The inspector wants your money, and I want to save it for you. So let's get down to brass tacks and think up some expenses to deduct. You like my hat? Yes, charming. Do you like me? Uh, yes. Good. I like you. You know, I, I don't feel very much like concentrating on this stuff. Yeah, so I've noticed. Why not bring all the papers up to my apartment this evening? Am I being invited to come up and see you sometime? <laughs> yes. Are you trying to make a fool of me? No. No, I mean it. You know it's exactly five minutes since we met? Well, that's got nothing to do with it. I knew after three minutes. Less than that. Uh, what exactly did you know? Do I have to put it into words? Uh, no, no, no. no I don't think we'd better. Uh, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hand you over to one of my partners, a very nice old gentleman with very long white whiskers. And I'll get him to telephone you tomorrow. You're not playing fair, you know. You let me see just now that you were interested. Interested? You ought to have snubbed me earlier. Good Lord, I'm not snubbing you, but I really don't know if I'm on my head or my heels. You know, this sort of thing's probably an everyday occurrence with you. No, it isn't. Not like this. Well, nothing even remotely like it has ever happened to me. You might get used to it. My child, you realize I'm just a stodgy, middle-aged, married man. I don't mind you being married. Well, that's extremely magnanimous of you, but... No, 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 oh, no, my dear, it wouldn't do. I'll tell you why. Why? Uh, I've forgotten. Are you coming to see me tonight? Uh, yes, I am. Nine o'clock? Uh, do you know I've got a daughter nearly as old as you? Nice, quiet girl? Well, I wouldn't call her that, though I can't see her... Throwing herself at a man? Oh, don't you be too sure. Nine o'clock. Uh, yes? Shall I bring the letters in for you to sign, Mr. Hilton? Yeah, perhaps you better had, yes, Elsie. Sir. Uh, I think my secretary feels you should go. Nine o'clock? Now, look here. I, I don't think either of us is exactly sane. Nine o'clock? Uh, yes. Good. We can now compose our expressions for the entrance of your secretary. Don't you think you ought to look a little less intense? In a moment, we will continue with the third act of Call It A Day, produced by the Theater Guild on the air and sponsored by the United States Steel Corporation. Here again, speaking for United States Steel, is George Hicks. One day back in March 1903, a steel plant at Lorraine, Ohio, employed a new office boy. His name was Jones, George H. Jones. He went to work right after finishing the seventh grade because he had to help support his family. Today, that Lorraine, Ohio steel plant has become a part of the National Tube Company, one of the members of the United States steel family. And George Jones, well, the office boy who'd only finished the seventh grade, is now the chief engineer of the whole Lorraine Works, a very important and highly technical job. The story of how George got there is the story of an immense amount of hard work, a story of constant study and application, but it's also the story of opportunity because young Jones was able to get the education and training he had to have from courses sponsored by the National Tube Company. He was able to learn mechanical drawing and drafting and engineering in company classes. And as his knowledge and experience increased, he was promoted to pattern maker, to tracer, to draftsman, to engineer, and finally to chief engineer. George Jones reached this important position thanks to his own intelligence, his own hard work, and his company's employee training program. Giving employees the chance to get ahead by learning to do bigger and better jobs is part of the basic policy of all members of the industrial family that serves the nation, United States Steel. And now the curtain rises on the third act of Dodie Smith's gay comedy success, Call It A Day, produced by the Theater Guild on the Air and sponsored by United States Steel, starring Lynn Fontan and Alfred Lunt as Dorothy and Roger Hilton. Oh, Mommy, I'm so terribly guilty about taking a taxi. 
But you know, when one's excited, one does things one's not quite responsible for, doesn't one? Yes, I think perhaps one does. And then you have to go on with them. Yeah. Oh, Mommy, isn't it peaceful sitting out here sort of friendly? What are you looking at? A star? Yes, there to the left of the chimney. Oh, I see, see it? it. The first star is awfully lucky, you know. Isn't everything clear and pale? Shelley talks about the pale purple evening, but this isn't purple, is it? It's a sort of pearl. Isn't it nice us being quiet here together? I wouldn't call you exactly quiet. Oh, I am inside. Would you excuse me now? I'm going to write a poem before dinner. All right, dear. I wish I could write like Edna Malay or like Shelley. I arise from dreams of thee in the first sweet sleep of night when the winds are breathing low and the stars are shining bright. Why, Mother, you know. Why not? When the winds are breathing low and the stars are shining bright. I arise from, from dreams, dreams of thee, and a spirit in my feet hath led me, who knows how, to thy chamber window sweet. How beautiful. Hello, Doc. Oh, I didn't hear you put the car away, dear. No, I, I've uh, got to go out again. <laughs> nice. Yes, yes, that girl, that Miss Gwynne, her fairs in a holy muddle. I've oh. got to straighten them out. I brought you some violets. Oh. Oh, it's not my birthday till next month. <laughs> Well, they're very lovely. Do we say you have to go back to the office? Uh, no, no, I'm going to see her. Doctor didn't want her to play tonight, and since we didn't accomplish much this afternoon, I thought I'd finish up this evening. Um, <laughs> by the way, uh, you saw her, didn't you? Uh, is she any good? Oh, yes, yeah, she's rather remarkable. Queer and spasmodic, but full of feeling. Did you like her? Oh, so, so, yes, yeah, seemed all right. Must you go and see her tonight? Frank Haynes is coming over. Who's Frank Haynes? You know, Muriel's brother, the rubber planter. We had cocktails with him today. Yeah? Must you go in town to see this Gwyn girl tonight? Good Lord, Doc, what's the matter with you? Do you think I'm smitten with her or something? Well, no, I hadn't thought of that before. Are you waiting for somebody, miss? Yes, officer. You've been here quite a while, haven't you? I don't know. I'm just waiting. No loitering, you know. I'm not loitering. Say, you're kind of young, aren't you? Hadn't you better go home? I'll wait a while, if you don't mind. Have it your own way. I wonder where everybody is. Why do you keep watching the door? You're not listening to a word I'm telling you. Oh, yes, I do. Frank, I, it's just that I'm worried. Why doesn't Gas come home? Why doesn't Roger come home? Why do you want them to come home? Don't you understand what it means to me to be here alone with you? Don't you understand what I've been through all these years in Brazil? Well, of course I do. I, I've been really moved by what you told me. Have you really? Have you? Oh, of course I have. Perhaps that's why I keep watching the door. I'm afraid not just for them also, but for myself on this first day of spring. Well, then you do understand. Oh, come now, come now. If you knew how I've thought about you these last few hours and longed to talk to you and be with you and touch you and... And kiss you. Oh, I don't think that would be wise. There you go, watching the door again. It just feels so odd to have the house so quiet. I'm not used to it. It's almost as if they left us alone on purpose. Maybe they did. Maybe it's fate. Fate? I hadn't thought of that. Don't you see? I'm sure it was. Now, Frank, I do like you, really. I'm quite fond of you. But I... And I want very much for you to be happy and to be married to the person you love. But that's you. That's got to be you. Yes. Uh, no. Um, uh, let... Le uh, let me get you a cool glass of lemonade. Now then, I think a deduction of 15% on item 4A would not be amiss. Now let's put that down. How can you keep thinking about 15% and deductions and all that? My dear young lady, don't you think we'd better at least make a stab at finishing off this job? Oh, why don't you relax? Oh, I don't dare. Take your coat off. Uh, you think I should? You'll feel better. It's warm. <clears throat> yeah, you may be right. It's more comfortable over here by me. Why don't you come and sit here? Uh, well, perhaps I could work more comfortably over there. Very well. Yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah, very comfortable. Yeah, yeah, much better. Well, uh, what should we talk about? What do we do? Do? Yes, do. Oh, oh, do. Oh, uh, uh, do you want me to tell you? Yes. 
Would you like to know what I've been thinking, what's in my mind, what in my innermost thoughts I've been planning for you and me? Yes. Shall I tell you? Of course. Then this is what I thought we'd do, my sweet young thing. Take 4% of item 38, <laughs> add to schedule C, then subtract oh, from 58 or 59B, whichever is the larger, this and use the difference between like this, in that computing sort of the... When fate brought s- us together. Fate? I thought it was the Bureau of Internal Revenue. <laughs> I tell you, I've guessed what's wrong. I'm psychic, you know. You're in love with Mr. Francis. I'm not. Don't shout. They'll hear. It's not true. Don't you know he's a married man? Wait a minute. I'll come over to your bed. There. I'll wrap this around me. Aren't you shocked? You can't shock a person whose favorite king is Charles II. (laughs) Has he ever kissed you? No. He nearly did once. Oh, he's been so mean to me. He promised to meet me tonight. Oh, Kath, what happened? He never came. I waited and waited nearly two hours. And a policeman came by and told me to go home. Oh, what am I to do? What am I to do? Children. Get back in your own bed quick. What are you children chattering about? It must be midnight. I never can find this light switch. Oh, Mom, don't put the light on. You'll spoil everything. We were looking at the moon. Oh, it is lovely, isn't it? I thought you'd appreciate it. Kath, you might have come in to see Mr. Haynes when you came back from your walk. I was tired. There was a telephone message for you. Who from? Mrs. Francis. They're leaving tomorrow quite suddenly, joining friends in Santa Fe. But but the picture isn't finished. Well, she seemed doubtful if he'd ever finished it. I must say I thought it was pretty casual after all those sittings. Artists are like that. I do hope you don't mind, darling. Oh, no. No, the sittings were rather boring. Now, no more talking. Good night. Oh, Jeff, don't, please. It's a terrific compliment, really. He's gone away because of his conscience. To leave me without a word. Oh, if only I could die. Jeff, please. Oh, gosh, they're knocking on the wall. Get back to bed. I'll die if Mother comes in again. Wouldn't it be awful if she found out? Jeff. It must be funny to be old like that and know nothing exciting can ever happen to you. It must be peaceful. They haven't a worry in the world. Talking like mad at this time of night. What? The children. Oh. <sighs> My, it feels good to get into bed. Yeah, I'm kind of tired myself. Feels wonderful to stretch out. Want me to leave the light on a while? I want to read? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Cass doesn't seem to be at all upset about Frances going away and leaving her portrait unfinished. I've been to her age. Say that, uh, what's-his-name stayed pretty late? Muriel's brother? Did he? I didn't notice. I must say, I think you might have come in for a minute instead of sneaking upstairs. Didn't she like it? Was he boring? No. He wasn't at all boring. How was your actress friend? Oh, all right. Was she nice? Who? Who, the Gwyn girl? Yes, who else? Oh, she's just an actress. Just an actress? Well, can't you leave her alone? You've been one mass of suspicions ever since I first well, mentioned her. all things, if you want to put ideas into my head. Well, can you honestly tell me that you haven't had your teeth in Beatrice Gwyn since well, the first minute you knew I was going to see her? Certainly I can. I did think it was queer when you absolutely refused to cancel your appointment with her. Oh, you But I wasn't did. suspicious. I'm sorry if I gave you that impression. Oh, don't apologize. Oh, I don't know why you should get so savage about it unless... Unless there was something in it. Go on, say it. Stop putting words into my mouth. What's the matter with you? I've told you I'm sorry if I seem suspicious. I've never been suspicious before. Well, you've never had any cause before. Oh, I see. Then I have cause now. I see. Look, Dad, I've made an awful fool of myself. Oh, you have. You want to tell me? Oh, I think so. Did she start it? Oh, well... She, did she find uh, the office stop to flirtation and so asked you to her apartment? Yes, darling, but it wasn't a flirtation. What do you mean, Roger? 
Roger, I'll... how dare well, you? Now, 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 just stop jumping to conclusions. Roger, will you, you tell I... me at once what happened? Nothing happened, but it wasn't a flirtation. Well, then what do you mean? What oh, was it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. She's not a girl you can flirt with. There's something so ruthless about her. You know, I think she'll be a great actress well, one day. Well, what's that got to do with it? You say nothing happened? Oh, well, you're taking it all so seriously. I see. You just want me to pat you on the back, be the sort of wife who's amused at her husband having affairs, who has affairs herself. Well, then, if you want to know, I also... What do you mean? You want to know, I've had a... Well, I've uh, had... I've, uh, I've had uh, an uh, offer. Uh, uh, I've what? had an offer. <laughs> I have. There's someone who, uh... Someone uh, who, well, someone, you know, uh, a man. Oh, oh, a has, man. Uh, has what's-his-name been holding your hand nothing, all evening? Nothing to laugh at. It's a very serious yeah, matter. Yeah, I know with you at first sight, I thought. accident. Uh, uh, <laughs> me for someone else. It's a very long and very sad story, and I haven't the slightest intention of telling well, you about it. Well, thank you very much. Is this Haynes proposing you should help him no, to enjoy no, his stay? Nothing like that at all. He wants to marry me. The whole thing's on a different level from your rotten little intrigue. Oh, when... <laughs> Hi, Quite high-handed. Yes, yes, it yes, is. Yes, just proposing I to break it. up a man's home. I Ma- not, I tell you. The whole thing's terribly sad. I sent him away. But, Merle, well, you could whistle him back. Me no. tell you that if he ever sets foot in this house again... He's setting foot in it next Saturday. He's coming to dinner. Of all the outrageous women, what not would you say all? if I asked Beatrice Gwynn here? Oh. What would anyone say of a man who brought his girlfriend Thank into the house? Thank you my girlfriend. <laughs> I mean, he's not my boyfriend. <laughs> well, you can laugh. I've done nothing to be ashamed of. The whole thing's a tragedy for Frank. And I'm going to do everything I can to help him. I want him to meet the children. Well, for utter indecency, give me the high mind. I'm not indecent. Well, I'd like to know what is. Don't shout at me. I'd like to know who has Stop had a right. Shouting. Stop shouting. I am shouting. not shouting. I... Uh, are our children asking us to keep quiet? Well, they might, I think. Uh, Dad, uh, this uh, is a little silly, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, let's reach over, reach over and kiss me. Oh, Roger, dear. You can do what you like about the Gwyn girl. I'll just do the family knitting and sit in a chair like Whistler's mother. Oh, no, I didn't. No, I, I, I don't want to do anything about that girl. I started by telling you that I'd made a fool of myself. Oh, if you want to go on with it, it's no use just forcing yourself to give her up. Oh, I'm not forcing myself. Well, what about Frank Haynes? Oh, I knew all the time he never really threatened you. And you think this girl really threatened you? I don't want to think about it. Darling, did did we really drift to the point where we were taking each other for granted? I don't know. Did we? Have we both become household fixtures? Dot, listen to me. All these years, living far away on my lonely rubber plantation, <laughs> isolated from all feminine companionship, I've dreamed of finding someone like you. <laughs> and now that I've found you, I know at first glance that I'm madly in love with you. Leave that stodgy husband of yours, oh, that God. commuting suburbanite, and be mine. Are you sure you really love me? Oh, of course. Oh, it's not just the glamour you're after. You don't want me because I'm a famous ballet dancer and the toast of kings. Oh, no, no, and indeed. it's not just because my legs are insured for three million dollars. Well... And I've had a navy blimp named after me. <laughs> because I'm the pin-up girl of Scarsdale. Oh, no. No, no, I love you because you're Dot, the girl... Oh, I see every day just pleasantly and glamorously on the skinny side. <laughs> I don't love you for your rubber millions, but because you're Roger who has to be shaked in the morning. Then will you always shake me yourself from yes, now on? Yes, darling, I will. Shall we turn out the light? Yeah, turn it out. Where's that quilt? It's on the foot of your bed. Funny turning so cold after such a lovely day, isn't it? Oh, it was just a fluke. We'll be back to normal again tomorrow. Good night, sweet. Sweet, good night, Roger. Fallen on the Theater Guild production of Call It a Day, presented by the United States Steel Corporation, starring Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontan. And now here is a special announcement from Mr. Alan Churchill, managing director of Stage Pictorial, the illustrated magazine of the theater. Mr. Churchill. Stage Pictorial's Blue Ribbon Scroll of Merit is presented to the United States Steel Corporation, its chairman of the board, Mr. Irving S. Oles, and the radio program, 
the Theatre Guild on the Air, for contributing to the encouragement of the dramatic arts by bringing the world's outstanding stage plays with the theatre's foremost stars to millions of listeners every Sunday evening. At this time, I should like to present Mr. J. Carlisle MacDonald, assistant to the chairman of the board, United States Steel Corporation. Mr. MacDonald. In the absence of Mr. Irving S. Olds, chairman of the board of United States Steel, I accept with pleasure the scroll which stage pictorial has awarded the corporation in recognition of the high quality of our Theater Guild on the Air program. In the 39 weeks we have been on the air, we have had two main objectives in mind. One, to make our large listing audience better acquainted with the corporation and its policies. Two, to provide the best in dramatic entertainment by recreating, through the medium of radio, the atmosphere of the theater. Tonight's award and the many other awards accorded of this program are indeed appreciated. If they are an indication that we have been moderately successful in attaining the objectives which I have just mentioned, we are happy. I should like to express the hope that our listening audience will continue to share this hour with us each Sunday night for the next 13 weeks, when we will present the only full hour mystery show on the air. Outstanding stars of stage, screen, and radio will play the leading roles in dramatizations of the world's most famous mystery novels. And here is Lawrence Langner again. Ladies and gentlemen, when we of the Theatre Guild are on our summer vacation, United States Steel will bring you, as Mr. Brokenshire will explain in detail, a series of full-hour mystery dramas. Starring next week in Eric Ambler's Journey into Fear is that outstanding actor, Lawrence Olivier, of the famous Old Vic Company, who has appeared in such great films as Wuthering Heights, Rebecca, and his new masterpiece, Henry V. Don't miss Mr. Olivier in Eric Ambler's great story, Journey into Fear, next week at this time. I know I'll be listening, too. And now here's Mr. Brokenshire again. The United States Steel Corporation hopes that you'll be with us next week at the same time when we bring you our new summer program, The Hour of Mystery. The really great works of such masters of mystery as Eric Ambler, Dashiell Hammett, Van Wyck Mason, and others. So don't miss the first play in this great new series. Remember, next Sunday, same time, same station, Journey into Fear, starring Laurence Olivier on the United States Steel Hour of Mystery. And remember, too, that when you see the USS label on any product, it means the steel is good. The staff for the Theatre Guild on the Air includes Homer Fickett, director, George Condolph, producer, and Armina Marshall, executive director of the radio department. Music for tonight's play was composed and conducted by Harold Levy, the play adapted for radio by Eric Barno and Mary Hunter. Your announcer, Norman Brokenshire. Broadcasting Company.